so last week I was saying that my my cell modem I use on my on this robot here. Um, I, I was saying that that doesn't work anymore, and I think it's due to the three D shut three G shutdown. I tried to negotiate with the the people, and their support is worthless. And it, it went through a, after the third time. They said, "Oh, well, here's how you fix your camera." I wrote back, "I don't have a camera. I got this other thing that that you sell. That, that I didn't buy it from them, but they they sell it." And I think at that point they closed my closed my support ticket and then sent me an email and said, oh, are you satisfied or unsatisfied? So I said, well, I'm totally unsatisfied. I, I need to know, is this going to work for 4G? And I got several days, I got nothing back. So yesterday or the day before, I just went, clicked on the thing, said cancel the account, and then went to my PayPal and said, don't give these people any more money. So I'm done with that. So I either have to find a new cell, cell modem account or have to figure out how to get my cell phone to do data or figure out how to get correction data in the house and have a radio to talk to the robot while it's driving around. So that's, that, that's really all I got done this week. So that's, that's, that's where what, I'm at on that. Is this that RTK data? Yes. It's a correction data for RTK. What's the volume? It's, it's quite low. It's uh, I think it says, um, when, when I run it, I think it says like six, 6k bits per second or something is what it what it comes up and it comes out in bursts but that's what the average is so it's something fairly slow and not much data and if i have to i could decimate that down and say i think they give me a burst of correction data once a second and i could just say skip a bunch of them and just send it because i don't think i have to send it at the rate that they're giving it to me so that'd be another option so i, I could send it over really low speed radio probably if i really wanted to so that's something i need to look into and figure out what to do on that so anyway, this is just one more thing in my way now to get anything done. So that's just another excuse to not do anything, I guess. <clears throat> so Let's... Al, didn't didn't you use an the the L low ran? I have two or three radio topologies going on between my radio control handheld radio control unit and the tractor. To when I'm in manual mode, I use LoRa. And we, we went over all these options last week. So if, if you're oh, wants to, I'm sorry. Anybody wants to know, you can go back and watch last week's meeting. And I ran through like four or five different ways I could communicate to it. So, okay. I, I, I did have not... to go back to that or get my cell modem working again. So that's, 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 again, that's, that's where I'm at. So that's, that's what I'll be thinking about. So I think that's all that I have to say. Well, I, I took uh, both my laptops with me to Illinois. Um, thinking that I would get to them in the evening to play around with the, the turtle. Uh, ended up not spending any time on that. But when I uh, got home and booted up my Unix box, it wouldn't boot. It uh, just gave the, a, a purplish screen. And I've been trying to get it to reboot, reload, plugging and unplugging my original USB source. And I'm just wondering if in the, the jostling, the disk drive got loosened or something. So I'm going to take the back off and reseat the, the memory, the two memory cards and the, uh, the disk drive and, Otherwise, I'm not sure what I'm going to do. Is there any data on that hard drive that you need, or are you just simply no. starting up? Because if you get in a situation like that where it won't boot, you can pop the hard drive out and put it in a different computer and read all your files off there and then put it back in and then re reformat it and go from there. So that's that's one way to get around it. If, if it looks like you know it's it, you can't go any further like that, you, you can always pull the hard drive out and recover stuff and then you know go go from there. Yeah. The the only thing that that's on the hard drive is the operating system, ROS, and then what little Python code I've written for playing with the the turtle simulation, which I've done the I've done the mental exercises, so recreating it would not be worth the time it would take to do all of the pulling it off. But okay. that's uh, 
So my goal is to get that running on this old Acer. Um, I'm also having my windows crash about once a day for no apparent reason. So I'm, and I've gotten authorization to go out and get a new laptop. So I'm going to uh, go looking at what I want from uh, Micro Center. Um, lots of memory, solid state drive, um, numeric keypad. And I'll probably have to get one of those uh, USB ports just because there's I have lots of USB things I want to kick connect up and most of the PCs these days, laptops these days only have one or two USB ports. But then I may then I may try and load uh, Ubuntu on this old one because it seems to be a um, NVIDIA driver issue that keeps causing it to crash. I tried updating the the driver, uninstall, reinstall, and periodically it'll just reboot. And it always it has something to do with the um, the driver. That's what the blue screen says if I if I'm here watching it. Get any different behavior if you're on battery power versus connected to the wall? Um, I'm almost never on battery with my laptop. <laughs> so because sometimes they the symptom can be a video driver, but it's because they consume a lot of power and um it's really an inherent power issue, but yeah, sounds like a motherboard issue to me, but that's just a guess. Could be. So on a totally unrelated note, have you checked back lately to see on your drill battery if the guy that was trying to decode those messages, if you got any farther on that? I just, it he's, just occurred to he, me for, a, for the moment. He's gotten a little bit further, but not much further. Um, I think he's gotten one more message and got some of the bits defined. But it's like, I'm not really sure what these do. I just know they change between half full and full. Okay. But I've been uh, a little busy lately, so. I guess it's to you, Al. Okay, let's see. Um, Zoom isn't what you wanted to see. This is, as a reminder, you know, the frame of my tractor, or the picture of a frame of my tractor. And I have a, a servo that I'm going to talk about that's mounted basically here. The transmission, as you would guess, is back here. Um, this is an underside of the transmission. And the reason I shared this picture is because that spring is connected to that control rod that goes up here. Um, if I make that just a little bit bigger. And, you know, the thought occurred to me someday, somehow, but not now. What would happen if the thrust panel, I think is what they call it, thrust plate maybe, and a hydrostatic transmission, um, is it serving the purpose of keeping it in neutral when your foot is off the thing? And if so, right now it takes 40 pounds of pressure for the servo to move that control arm. If I took that spring out, would I screw the pooch, as they say, or would it make it easier to... Um, control that, I'm going to call it a thrust plate, control that thrust plate. But that's not what I wanted to talk about today. Um, I just wanted to share those with you to orient 
you. So now I'm looking on th these three photos are from this side looking towards the servo and the there's a drive belt here and I've got a bungee cord here pulling the drive belt back because getting this servo on and off is um, a little bit of a challenge and moving that moving that belt out of the way helps. And before I took it off, because I wasn't, my issue, my problem statement was I wasn't getting good control of the speed and the, the pure pursuit relies um, on speed to do its calculation. And so I took a couple pictures here to show, I mean, it's not moving obviously, and but this is sort of what I get on servo movement. If it's in reverse, this is the neutral position and this is forward so if you look at the tire you can see a little bit of you know the movement there so it's not a ton of movement so when i took the servo off which is here it's a super servo 200 um you there is a the shaft is i think nine millimeters in diameter. Um, and so this is a collar, a nine millimeter collar. There's a set screw inside there. And you ask, well, how in the heck did he get that off when the set screw still be there? <laughs> that was a little bit of a challenge uh, because the set screw had dug its way into that shaft. And um, I, thinking it was a smart thing to do, use Loctite red to because i had previously had that set screw come loose um and i used loctite red to try to avoid that and by golly that set screw didn't move but that didn't keep it from over time wearing out that shaft or causing issues with that shaft so anyway where i'm at now is i have Gotten that set screwed out with um, applying heat from a torch, comes right out, just need a little heat. Throwing away the old set screw, put in a new set screw, drilled a hole in the shaft so I could move the collar and set screw further down the shaft to an unmarred location. And I drilled a new hole for the control arm to connect um, just to see if that would give me better uh, better results. I've driven it around. I've got a few settings here for my PWM control because I think part of my reason for this disfiguration is when I use a PID, I mean, it's constantly at 10 hertz, I think, was the control algorithm at 10 hertz. It's, you know, moving that throttle, trying to get to the preferred position. And so if I change from PID-based, always trying to get perfect to a fixed PWM rate at some, you know, pre-prescribed uh, more or less speed, would that be okay? And for me, it's a little bit like driving my real John Deere tractor. You put it in second gear or third gear and you just go on. And if you're running at a set RPMs, you're gonna get a basic speed unless, um, you know, you juice it with the throttle or something. So anyway, that's my thinking is to have some presets and trying to figure out those presets. Um, This is a chart from Plot Juggler showing two different speed values that I have access to. One is driven by the wheels and one is driven by the GPS. The red line is from the wheels. Uh, the purple line is from the GPS. It This is when RTK fix kicks in 
Um, this gap is when I'm actually going in reverse and the wheels recognize that it's reverse, but the satellite, you know, I don't have any programming in there to change the speed based on if it's going backwards or not. Um, and this gap is triggered by going in a circle and, um, you know, this, the red speed is an average between the left and right wheel and those are the circles and this is what the wheel speed looks like. The right is going a little bit faster than the left. Um, so that's where I get that gap. So otherwise, um, I think I have for the time being until that servo gives out again, gotten reasonable reasonable control over my speed. Uh, I've also made some changes to this program. I was getting some spikes in uh, a value in my ODOM message for um, well, this is just I changed the ODOM to get speed from the wheels and I also changed put a clamp in there on a value called self-angular velocity Z uh, because I was getting some crazy numbers. Um, so next step, more testing, bottom line, um, some progress with getting the servo back installed and hopefully a little bit more stable speed control, but um, more testing to do. And that's where I'm at. Can you scroll back down to that last thing you were showing, that graph? This one? Uh, actually, go down, keep going, right there. So you, the, the one that says speed data, is that the one out of GPS? The purple one? Purple is GPS speed. I know, for, for whatever reason, that's following your left uh, left wheel speed, and I don't know. Oh, why that is it could be it you could have differences as you're turning because your gps is not directly over base link and the wheel odometry is calculating your position at base link when you're taking the left plus right divided by two that's actually the center of the back where, where your base link is and i i was thinking your gps was offset maybe to one side and slightly in front of uh, base link so that that might account for I guess the graph above where you showed that you had said when you're turning there's a difference between the two that might be yeah that one right there that might be what's causing that I'm not sure so the next next thing was you said uh, you had those calculations you're you're limiting that value are you still calculating your own value so you're, you're taking you're, you're generating your own angular velocity value Yes. Did you look at the one coming out of the the, the uh, IMU to see what it looks like? Zero. Yes, I did. And it's not, there's no data in that part of the message. Huh. It, you know, since that's one of the major functions, it seems like it should have something in there. Or, or are you still looking at linear Z? coming out of the IMU. I know you kept obsessing over that, which that's the, that's the accelerometer that has nothing to do with the, the angular anything. I can, uh, it's been a while since I looked at it. I can go back and try to see if there's any data coming out of the, the IMU, but my recollection is that's, it was zero. And that's why I went down the path of uh, calculating, uh, calculating it myself over time. That's true, but you kept saying you were looking at, at linear Z as opposed to angular Z, which is the accelerometer as opposed to the gyroscope. So you, you really should check that because then all this, this stuff with spikes will go away if that's if that's putting out a valid value. And I laid that out in that big like two or three page thing that I, I posted. I don't know if I put that on. I think I sent that to you personally as opposed to, yes, you did. As opposed to putting on Slack. So. Yeah, I'll go back and look at that because obviously I would rather get it straight from the IMU, but for some reason they um, 
Well, I'll go back and double check. Uh, so the next thing was on your, uh, that arm that's on your servo, do, do you still have that little round plate that came with your Super 200 that, that goes on, onto the shaft? Yeah, I do. I mean, I looked at it based on your suggestion and... Because the D shaft, that's going to give you a much better fit and it's going to, you're not relying on a set screw to, uh, to hold the thing at that point. And I've got it downstairs. I should have brought it up. I was expecting it to have a shape specifically around the, the D, call it a D. Yeah. Like this nine millimeter, it's, it's, uh, there's no D in it. It's just a circle. Yeah. And so it's going to give me the same, what I have is the adhesion from, you know, a nine millimeter circle plus a set screw. It's this, it physics wise, it's the same. Oh, the it's plate that came with it doesn't, doesn't have the D shaft. It just got a, a round hole in it. The, I, I, I assume that's what you're trying to tell me. Yeah, the original plate that came with this does not have a D-shaped interior. It is a circle with a set screw. Oh, I guess it won't help you then. Because that, that plate that came with it, I believe, is made out of aluminum. Whereas if you get the open frame ones and buy the plate, that's a steel plate. And those are give you a very good uh very good fit and being steel it's not gonna not not gonna rip it up so and i can't look at mine because the the other thing that i think i've mentioned this several times before but the the, the plate that you buy for the the super 200 and the one you buy for the open frame ones the whole size is slightly different so you can take the one off the super 200 and put it on open frame servo but if you try to take the steel ones from the open frame and put them on Super 200, they won't fit because the hole size is a few thousands off and it will not go onto the shaft. So anyway, that's just just something I noticed because I when when I was doing this before, I had my Super 200 on my on my this robot back here, and then um, when I put on the the open frame one, I just left that same plate on there, so it's already drilled and ready to go. So I. I, I didn't really think about it at the time that that was going to be going to be an issue. So, and and so not just to mention that because that kept falling off on me, and then I had to end up lock tightening the the set screw. So yeah, that's probably true. It's probably just a round hole in that thing. And so anyway, just to confirm, the open frame servo, it's connecting has a D shaped in there. Yes, it does. Wow. Plus the set screw. Yes. It's actually got two set screws and I don't know if, if which one is right or whatever, but, but, but the D shaft, as I say, the, the, the ones that you buy to put, that are actually meant to go on there fit really well on the open frame ones and they're made out of steel. So you don't have to worry about it, you know, ripping up on you. So which the one for the super 200, that was aluminum that came, came up with that one. I noticed that too, but was mostly interested in the D shape when based on your note. And that takes us back to you're talking about your transmission spring. And I think, yes, that would be very much to your advantage if you could take that out. But I always thought it would be, what are you going to risk by taking this transmission apart? You might be able to just pop the cover off. And if you're lucky, it won't rip up the gasket. So you pop the cover off, pull that spring out. It looks like there's a, uh, right in the center there, it looks like there's a, a screw that goes down through the, your control shaft. So you'd probably have to take that screw out pull the shaft out, take the spring off and put it back together. And you, what you should do, if you're, if you're thinking about doing that ever, go look on YouTube, see if somebody talks about te tearing your transmission apart, just so you can see what steps it takes to get it apart. And if they warn you about anything as they're, as they're doing that. But yes, you don't, for what you're doing, you don't need that extra spring working against that extra spring there. Because mine doesn't have that built in. So mine, I can just set it to a position that stays there. Mm. I, I haven't actually got it running yet, but you know, it seems like that that should that should work because the spring is just working against you right now because you have to you have to force against that spring and that's eventually either your servo is going to burn up or as you found out it's tearing up the shaft on your your servo because you're working against so much force on that. It's a down the road thing. Maybe the next time my servo craps out, I'll get frustrated and um, have to do that. But you I did find two videos that were both helpful this picture is actually from one of them where they did a nice job of 
tearing it apart and putting it back together. But they were not focused on this spring. They were focused on the the hydraulics and and um, replacing some of the gears if the gears were worn. But anyway, I thought it was a good photo, so that's why I included it. Yeah. So so anyway, the, the bottom line is before you before you try taking anything out, before you even take the transmission out, you know, go 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 watch the videos and see if anybody has any comments on good points or bad points before you before you get it all torn apart and think, oh man, it's not gonna work and then have to put it all back together again without getting anything accomplished. So or or worse for me, making it worse than I lose a part or bend a part or Yeah, that's true. <laughs> uh okay so moving on to the next thing i i was making notes as you were talking you said on your 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 big tractor does that have a hydrostatic transmission or is that a manual transmission on that manual so in that case you know you put it into a fixed gear ratio and then whatever you run your throttle is how fast the thing is going to go then so that brings us to the next point you know you keep talking about having a control loop to adjust your servo to adjust your forward speed well keep in mind your engine also has a control loop built into it because the gasoline engines have a governor built in so when you set the throttle to say 2000 rpm it's going to attempt to hold it at that speed because you were talking about going up hills and going down hills and going into heavy grass the engine automatically compensates and brings your speed back to uh close to where where you had it set originally so if you've got that controlling the speed up and down and you're trying to measure the forward speed adjust your servo you've got now got two control loops working against each other or potentially working against each other at that point so that's going to make it make it harder to adjust any of this stuff because of that which goes back to the thought when i said you know if you just have what, what you call them presets so it'd be more like having a manual transmission you say put it in first gear second gear third gear you know just set your hydrostatic to whatever that position is and then um, as you go uphill or go downhill or go into heavy grass, your engine should automatically compensate and keep the, the input shaft turning at, at the same speed. I, I, I keep telling people that's true, but I haven't actually gone out and tried that. So I, I can't say that if I go out and drive around in my yard and try to drive up a hill or drive down a hill with my hydrostatic transmission, you know, does it indeed, um, does it indeed do that? So I'd have to have some way to measure my forward speed. And if I can get my, my GPS correction stuff working, I could do that. I can just take that speed and then drive up and down my driveway, which has a slight hill to it. And people across the street have some bigger hills. I they, they might let me come over there and drive up and down their hills. But So that's something that – yet another thing to, to explore one of these days. And as far as the engine speed, you know, take, take the example, say, the little gasoline push mowers. So, you know, you start the thing on your sidewalk and you – and you set the throttle of the speed you want, and you push it into the grass, and you'll hear the thing going, and it speeds back up, and then, then tries to maintain that speed while you're cutting grass. Well, your, your lawn tractor is doing the same thing, and you may or may not notice as you're driving around. I noticed mine with the big engine on it, as I as I say, go into the grass like that, it, it all of a sudden bangs the throttle open, and it the engine gets real loud and real clanky as it comes up to speed. You know, it tries to instantly come up to speed. So you you can you can hear it doing that. You know, so if you just go out and drive around, do you have an actual another riding lawnmower that's intact, or do you just have the one you've torn apart? Just the one I've torn apart. Because I was thinking, if you have a, a normal one, you can go out and drive around the yard, and, and you you know just you know just get the feel for how that works. Um, but it since you got your stored apart that would be hard to do to go out and actually ride it right now because i assume you took off the seat you took off the steering wheel so that'd be a little harder to do <clears throat> just like captain cortez burn the ships yeah but, but this goes back to concept you're you're able to measure speed right now and if you can set your your you know, to one of your presets that you're talking about if you're out of place in your yard where you can drive up and down do you have, do you have any hills maybe even your driveway is it slanted so you could just you know drive down the thing turn around drive back up and do that several times then go look at your plots and see uh you know with it just added preset location at whatever rpm the engine's running at see see how well that is maintaining the speed by doing that because you might be putting a lot of extra effort into it that you don't have to especially if it's going to work against you that that would be something to identify and i have an imu i can actually measure the <laughs> The angular the angle of the hill 
Yes, you can. And that will come off that will come off the linear, which is your accelerometers. That's where you get your pitch roll and yaws coming off that. I thought you were gonna say you could you could you could measure the speed by by your IMU and no, you can't because as you say it's putting on zero. <clears throat> so anyway. So yeah, that, that, that would certainly be a good experiment. Once you get this all put back there, you know, try driving up and down there and then go plot it and see, see what it's actually doing. So if you're driving along, say, flat, and then you come to the – start going up the hill, you'll see the speed will drop down, but it should come back up and correct itself. And so you should be able to see that on the – and as you say, if you're, you're measuring your, your pitch – while you're doing that, you can tell, you know, as the thing starts to go up a hill, you'll see that the RPM will drop down and it should come back up to correct for itself. And it should maintain the same, same speed going up the hill as you were on the flat ground. It's just the transition. You're going to see it change back and forth on you. Question is the, um, is, is the mower deck that controls the blade is, is that direct drive or is that, uh, also hydro? The mower, uh, deck is driven off the same belt that runs between the engine and the transmission. And so to engage the mower, you move this arm that moves a pulley that... Because enga engaging the, the blades will also bog down the engine until the governor kicks in. And yes. maybe putting some sort of speed sensor to measure that engine output, engine RPM, might be a good thing to have corresponding to the uh, vehicle speed. Mm -hmm. That's good to kind of help dampen the double effect of, okay, I need to speed up, and your governor's trying to do it while at the same time you're getting the transmission to do it. So... Moving back to something, Jeff, you said in an ODOM statement, if you go up a hill, all things else being equal, um, in the twist statement, it's not Z, it's not Y, is it? It must be X. Look under orientation up the top. Instead of twist, look under... I'd probably be under pose then, pose then orientation. So right there, pitch roll and yaw, is that what you want to know? And how yeah. did you how did you create those? Did you let plot juggler do that for you? This is just plot juggler that we're looking at on the screen now. And and right now on the screen it says pitch roll and yaw. Where did those come from? Did you go up the top oh. where it says tools and you said convert quaternion? Is that how you generated those? Because those are not part of a standard message. I haven't. I don't even know if there's any data in there because I don't know that I loaded it when I built the ODOM statement. Well, is this is this live right now? If you click on on one of those and plot it, can we see it? Yeah. See, it's all zeros. Well, zoom zoom way in on that. Well, I'm at. I mean, you can see the zero two and zero two. Okay. So if this is actual data, then go up to your IMU on the left there. I am you. And go under uh, uh, orientation. Look under um, one, one's going to be called Angular. And I, you got such a small window, I can't tell what you're doing there. So Angular velocity up at the top. Open that one. And click on Angular Z and plot that. What's that do? Well, you got something coming out of there. Now, this the scale X is at 150. Is that 150 seconds? There's 150 samples, or what is? What are we looking at there? Time, 150 seconds. That was the duration of the last run in the backyard. So it does look awfully, awfully noisy if it is giving you anything valid out of there. So it might be worth going back in your IMU and finding, you know, go back to the IMU driver and figure out, you know, where, where it reads it right out of the IMU 
I see if you can plot that because something something looks goofy there. That should be as you drive around, that should tell you, you know, how fast you're rotating left and how fast you're rotating right. Mm. But back to the, the the steepness of a hill. So look under probably under linear either linear look look under orientation while you got it right there. And again, look at uh, pitch degrees. No, oh, I'll be darned. So that's giving you something there. But but again, I don't know if, if it's just automatically converting those for you. Because again, I don't think those are in the actual message. So, so I think Plot Juggler created that pitch roll and yaw for you. So let's see, are we in the, uh, look under yaw degrees. Plot, plot yaw degrees. So that should be your heading coming directly out of the IMU. And I don't, I don't remember if you were trying to calculate that or I, th I think you were, the, the whole point was you're trying to calculate a yaw either from the, and you're taking either from the GPS or from something you were doing. And I don't remember, I think maybe wheel odometry. So anyway, that should be a valid, if you'd plot that against, um, the, the, the scale is going to be way off, but if you go look at, um, go back under your uh, your odometry and, and plot out one of your, your yaw values there, you might want to put it on a new tab because. It's, yeah, it's this is a scale that I'm zero to 2000. That's pretty odd yaw, but anyway. Um, and you notice there what what's the reason it's doing that is because as you go around and around circles, it's not overlapping. You know, when you go from zero to two pi or zero to three sixty, it's not wrapping back around. See, so it just continuously, um, as you go around a circle, it just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So it says from where you started, you're you're now fifteen hundred degrees off from where you started. So that's it, it's actually normally you have to calculate that yourself. So I don't know if if that's that's a good thing or a bad thing, but. So if you look under ODOM and then look under, uh, I suppose, orientation, that'd probably be what, pose orientation? And then, and I know you kept, you kept looking at that orientation Z, don't ever take just a partial piece of your, of your uh, quaternion and, and try to use it because that's, that's just worthless. So that one says yaw degrees there, is that what you just plotted? So yes. see, it looks the same as what you just had, except you got the spikes in there because you were calculating it yourself. See, the, the scale is off. It's, it's, this, this one says 600 degrees as well. It started at negative, almost negative 100. So it's like, like positive 600 degrees after going around. So that doesn't actually line up with the 1500 degrees that the other one said, unless, unless I missed the, the starting point for that one. But whenever you look at the stuff in your, your ODOM message, you said it came from the IMU. Well, then go ahead and plot it from the IMU and verify that what's coming out of there is, is what you think it is. Yeah, that makes sense. <clears throat> now, as far as the, uh, as far as these quaternions here, I think you can say, just for the sake of argument, go up to the top where it says tools on that tab up there. And then say uh, quaternion to R pi. Click on that. And now what you do, I think you come over to the left and click on, say, the W under pose and see if it fills those in. Maybe double click what to do. <laughs> so uh, I, I, don't rem I don't remember how to do this. You must select two times. Two. I was trying to do the right click deal like you do with a pose X, Y, yeah, I, I don't remember how this works, but somehow you can, you can tell it here and it, it creates new values. It'll say like pitch roll and yaw by the time you're done or RPY. And then when you're you're done, then you can go ahead and plot them like everything else. And this one, I think, see on the on the right there, I don't know if my picture's the way I'll move that. On the right, it says radians, degrees, or unwrapped unwrap angles. So so the you're looking at an unwrapped angle when it went up to 1500, a value of 1500. Oh. And you can tell it either radians or degrees there. So if you can figure out how this thing works, then you can directly plot a quaternion and then look at that both under your orientation for pose, under odometry, and then go back to IMU and look at your, uh, the angular, what do they call it there? Anyway, under the, 
no, there's orientation under IMU also. You can convert, use this to convert that and then compare the things. And theoretically, they should look the same, whether, you know, as long as you're getting it from the one you're creating or the one coming out of the IMU, they should be the same, same values coming out of there. Yeah, I, um, now how do I get out of that? Because there's also a custom series and there were quaternion to pitch roll and yaw. And so it's got this formula down here, but I, I, have you ever used this? I don't think I've ever figured that out, no. Because I saw briefly in a video, you you give this a name. Yeah, from what? Um, and then you can add this name over here somehow, but I haven't been able to get it to work. <clears throat> yeah, I think I looked at that and never figured out how that works. And I, you're better at Google searches than I am, but I couldn't find any Google searches to explain it either. But anyway, it's a, a untapped, it, untapped it source. Could be if you go to the top there, the tab that says help, they might either either tell you directly here or they might take it to send you to a web page. Probably cheat sheet might be that's their that that they've got a uh, yeah 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 advanced transforms filter transforms. So if you if, if you go back and figure out what that was called you might be able to find it on here and they might might give you an explanation of how this works. And then you, you you might be able to go out to YouTube because this guy puts YouTube videos up, and I'm not sure if they're you know detailed to a specific thing you're trying to do, but you know just following these instructions might give you enough information on how to make it work. Yeah, this is where you like create the name with in this particular case using this particular function, but. Anyway, I tried and I gave up. There's so. there's something else you can do. You know, we were saying, well, it's it's a really big number, and you're trying to get them, trying to plot two things on top of each other. I think you can just right click on a a plot that you've made, and then one of the options is scale or something like that. I think this is offset and scale. You can actually put a, a say divide it down by. If it was in degrees and you want radians, you can say divide by 57.3, you know, line your two plots up so you can compare them together. So there, you know, once you, once you play with plot juggler enough, it's really amazing what it can do. And, but I haven't, I haven't touched it since, I don't know, probably a year ago. So I, I really don't know anymore how it works. So that's where I'm at. Okay, and as far as where I'm at, I I I need to get correction data, and that's kind of where where I'm at at the moment. Anything else from Terry? Or are we done? I'm done. Okay.